The purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. It is no substitute for professional care by your doctor or your qualified health care professional. Never disregard or delay professional medical advice because of something you've heard on this podcast or in any linked material. Guests who speak on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Dr. Shirley neither endorses nor opposes any particular opinion discussed on this podcast. The views expressed on this podcast have no relation to those of any academic, hospital, practice, institution, or other entity with which Dr. Shirley may be affiliated. Welcome to Forever Fab, the podcast on fashion, the art of living, and all things beauty. This podcast is curated by Dr. Shirley Medea, MD, as the definitive source of holistic wellness through beauty. This week's episode is dedicated to conscious transformation. The title of this episode is Transformation Through Reading, Writing, Rhythmetic, and Race. This is my interview with Milagros Phillips. Milagros Phillips is a keynote speaker on race literacy, a TEDx presenter, certified coach, and a four-time book author, the most recent being Cracking the Healer's Code, a prescription for healing racism and finding wholeness. For more than 35 years, she has consulted, designed, and facilitated strategic learning programs for organizations seeking to enhance their diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. For more than 35 years, Milagros has consulted, designed, and facilitated such programs across many industries. Her programs use history, science, research, and storytelling to create compelling, life-transforming experiences. Milagros was the founding executive director of the National Resource Center for the Healing of Racism, and she has served as an expert in residence for the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. She co-developed the Race Equity Framework Model to end HIV. She's also a recipient of the 2021 New Thought Walden Award for Interfaith Intercultural Understanding. She is an artist, a Reiki master, and a teacher, a sound therapist, teacher of A Course in Miracles, and the creator of Race Demystified, a compassionate approach to healing from racial conditioning. Her guiding principle is that transformation is a conscious act, and her mission is to heal racism from the inside out. Are you aware that how you are conditioned to think and feel about others has impact on the quality of your own life? Did you know that education about race affects your bottom line? Let's discuss and get to the bottom of it all with Milagros Phillips. She joins me via StreamYard today to discuss race literacy, cracking the code, healing your own life, and the realities and myths about the ladder of success. Welcome, Milagros. Congratulations on your success. And thank you for becoming a beautiful member of the Forever Fab community. Thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today. Such an honor. I cannot wait to get this discussion started. So let's get at it. (laughs) Let's get at it. Tell me, what was your childhood like? We'll start from there. Oh, wow. So I was born and pretty much raised where the Middle Passage began. A lot of people don't realize that after Columbus went back to Spain in 1493, um, he went back and made several trips to the Dominican Republic. And, um, and that is where I come from. And, um, and so I was um, just this little kid who loved to dance and loved to sing and loved to draw and paint. I, I tell people that I was born enamored of the arts. Yes. And uh, I, uh, I still remember the first time my father took me to an art store. I couldn't have been any more than three because I remember I was in preschool. And, and I still remember the way that those color pencils smelled oh. <laughs> and there were easels on the windows, you know, and yes. I was just mesmerized, you know, uh, but I, um, I, I was the, the youngest of a family of nine, seven of which had survived, five brothers wow. and I had one sister, uh, two sisters died way before I was born and I was the baby. Wow. And I was a completely unexpected baby. Um, surprise yes total surprise the 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 youngest was 14 already 
And my mother, who kept getting bigger, thought she had a tumor. Mm. And um, eventually my father just made her go to the doctor, like practically dragged her to the doctor because she was like, <laughs> like, no, 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 I'm fine. You know, I yeah. said, get bigger, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and when she got there, the doctor examined her and said, well, you don't have a tumor, but you are pregnant. Yay. And they were like, that can't be because she was in her late 40s, you know. Wow. And uh, and she hadn't had children in, you know, 14 years. Right. And so um, but he said immediately, you you can't have this baby because you're too old. This is back in the 50s. You know, wow. like, you know, yeah. And oh, she goes, oh, I, I don't know how to do a tumor, but I do know how to do babies. That's <laughs> right. That's right. That's <laughs> like this. I know how to do, you know. And so. Uh, so that's how I sort of came to be. And that's how I got my name, actually. My name ah. actually means miracle. Oh, I was going to say, you're a miracle. You're a yes, miracle baby, was, aptly yeah. named. I was a miracle baby. <laughs> totally and, unexpected. <laughs> and so here you are. Yeah, and, yeah. and the same way that you remember the visit to the gallery or the art store with your father when you were just about three and you remembered the color colors of the pencils and I'm sure the visuals and everything – do you also recall the first time when you recognized or felt that you were either different or being treated differently? That came practically since I was born. You know, mm. um, I, I had very much an awareness that I was different from the other kids in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The block where we lived, um, we were the only dark skinned family. Um, and and so I already had a sense of that, but it was really cemented when um, one of the neighbors from across the street came over and asked what I wanted to be when I grew up. And yes, she yes. did that because I used to dance on the porch all day oh. long. I used to sing to make my own music and dance yes. on the porch. And so I was about four and she came over and she said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a ballerina. Yeah. And she said, well, you can't be a ballerina because there are no black ballerinas. Ooh. And she said, and, and I remember feeling that. And she said, uh, and I said, but yes, there are. And she said, no, next time the ballet comes on TV, look and see if you see anyone who looks like you. Ooh. And back then the ballet used to come on on Sundays in the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. but looked on TV and she was right. No one looked like me. Right. And I remember thinking, well, I'll be a flamingo dancer. Oh, <laughs> and then someone said to me, well, you can't do that either because there are no black flamingo dancers. Oh, my God. And then I remember thinking, well, then I'll be a singer. Yeah. And that became kind of a, a quest for quite a while in my life. I, I trained to be uh, an opera singer. Wow. <laughs> really? Yeah. I was a Carla Tura at the time. So by the time I came to the U.S. when I was 10 years old, that's I, I studied uh, music. I studied the vocal cords, as they say, right? Yes, yes. And, um, and I was probably the only 11-year-old who could sing the entire score to Lucia de la Mermor oh my in God. Italian. <laughs> in Italian. Okay, so feel free to answer any of these questions in your operatic voice because I'm sure it would be beyond amazing. How fabulous. Yes. yes. <laughs> I really don't sing anymore. Actually, that training served me well because in the 1990s, I became a sound therapist. Oh, wow. I'm just completely self-taught. I have no idea where the information came from, but suddenly I, I knew all the stuff about sound and sound therapy and how you can use it to heal the human body and what the human voice does and all of these things, right? Because yes. I was also studying Reiki and all, you know, alternative forms of healing. And so, yes. you know, this, this sort of the, the training that I had gotten yes. served me really well in that arena. And, um, you know, back then, like no, no one had heard of it. And, um, and so it was like brand new. I stopped teaching it in 1997. That's how long ago I was doing sound. Wow. Like, but you still use it because I heard a TEDx talk that you did and just, yes, your words are definitely impactful. Let, let's not get that twisted, but as a compliment to the words that you spoke, your voice has such a melody to it and a rhythm. You know, your voice takes us on this journey and you bring us right back to the reality, which is definitely, you know, a, a hard reality. But the way that you just bring us on this melodic journey and you, and you bring us back to where we are, there's so much hope in your voice that it's, it really is, in a way, miraculous. It's beautiful. 
Thank you so much. Thank you for saying that. You're I welcome. really appreciate that. You are welcome. Now, speaking about your recognizing that you were different and that you always felt different, how has your perception of yourself and race changed from that time when you were so young to now? Yeah, so uh, it, it's really been um, a journey of continual transformation. Mm. And so um, I remember when I graduated from FIT, um, trying to get a job on 7th Avenue and couldn't- So you did job. fashion, you did art, you fashion. did singing, you did fashion, girl. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm telling you, it was like art was in my veins. It still yes. is, you know, I yes. still think. Uh, but um, but it was really interesting to me because I, I couldn't get a job and I couldn't figure out what was wrong because I mm. didn't, I didn't have the nuances to really understand. Uh really understand. And, um, you know, and I, I faced a lot of the discriminations that we all face as people of color, you know, yes. the, the job's no longer available, blah, blah, right. blah, you know. The, right, the, right. But I think it was when I started to do transformation work with the sound healing and mm. the Reiki and, and this and that, that I started to ground within myself the awareness, like I was awakening to who I am, mm. who I truly am. Yes. Regardless of what the world says I am, can be, should be, ought to be, blah, 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 right? I yes. started to really awaken to um, to that essence in me, which, which is what I tell people, that essence is where your resilience comes from. Ooh. So it isn't just that your resilience, but that that resilience comes from somewhere within, yes. you know, and, and I started anchoring on that. And that has become um, the journey, but but it's been it's been quite a journey because one of the things that I discovered, as I delve into this from the perspective of race and racism, yes, was I remember doing a weekend of silence, and and I, I was halfway into it and I started to get really angry, mm. and that anger became rage, but I was doing a weekend of silence so I couldn't talk about it. Yeah. I couldn't, you know, so, so it was just like it was bubbling up in me and yes. all this rage came up. And I remember feeling like I was in the middle of this abyss of anger that I would never come out of. Hmm. And interestingly enough, by the end of that weekend, it, it not only subsided, but at one point I remember getting this wash of peace. Wow. And it just transformed everything for me because what I realized, in, you know, and again, there were, there there were periods of, of learning, right? Yes. What I realized was that this rage had been living inside of me mm. without my being aware of it or taking oh, yeah. it as a natural thing. Like it's natural, you yes. know, without even being conscious of it. Yes. So there was a kind of acceptance into that, that field of anger that yes. I didn't realize I had a choice about because I didn't understand it. Right. Right. But I remember having to walk through, you know, I, I remember one time getting this this intuitive hit that uh, that white people were also oppressed. Mm. And I, I just, I wasn't having it. <laughs> I, like, I don't think so. And here's why, right? And I had all the explanations for why right. they are not, right? That's right. And, yes. and so you were became, up here. Oh, yeah. Oh, totally. And it became this learning. And that's a great way of putting it. I was in my head about it. Yeah. When I got quiet and allowed it to drop into my heart, mm. that's when the transformation began. And then it was a connecting to my ancestors, Ooh. having that conscious awareness that I came from some place, mm -hmm. from some people who were extraordinary. And no one had taught me much about those people. Wow. Because we don't talk about them in the history books. We don't, you know, and I, and I mentioned that in the TED Talk, but one of the things that I said was nobody told me that these people were the first, the, the first sailors. Yeah. That they were the first traders, that they were the first travelers who settled the entire world. Like I had no clue who I was. The right? first merchants and all of that is in you. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I remind people that prior to colonization, the Europeans and the Africans had a longstanding history of trade and diplomacy. Yeah. And, you know, and so the, there's this 
humongously beautiful history yes. that I had no awareness of. And so, so it's hard to own your present when you don't understand your past. Very true. You know, and so it was that recognition of of the the power, the talent, the the innovation of my ancestors that really grounded me in. Wait a minute. <laughs> yes, this is why I'm extraordinary. That's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's because of who these people were and had how what they had to do to survive. Oh yeah, that makes me who I am today. And it also helps you to survive and be resilient throughout all the adversities that I'm sure and microaggressions and macroaggressions that oh, I'm sure yeah. you've experienced. Yeah. So it sounds as if your silence, you're having these days of just being still and not having to explain anything to anyone or say anything to anyone. This, this period of silence brought you compassion more than, right, um, an understanding of yourself and from whence you came, clarity on your source, and also connection to your source. And that must have been so powerful. So when you say that's when your transformation began, would you say that that period of time was also sort of the, um, the point at which you thought to yourself, okay, this experience is leading me to understand that I have to get educated on race and teach others about race? Is that when it started? Well, actually, I actually got my calling when I was 13 years old, the day that ah. Dr. King died. Yeah, I, oh, I wow. literally heard, I, I left myself in the bathroom to cry because I was so upset. Yeah. And um, and I, um, I I literally heard a voice that said, you're to continue the work. I didn't wow. know what that meant. But here's what I did know. I was yes. 13 years old. I was smart enough to know, mm -mm, we ain't doing that. Somebody just <laughs> killed that man for doing that. So there's no way in the world, right? Yeah. So I literally <laughs> fought it for most of my life. You yes. know, I like yes. there was no way I was ever going to touch race. And yeah. and then I um I started doing diversity work in organizations, and the conversation would always come around to race. Doesn't you know what it they, always? Yeah, it's like you know, you know what they say about calling. It keeps calling you till you finally oh, yes. say yes, right? Absolutely. And so, Absolutely. You know, eventually I realized. Um, that I'd been given a gift mm -hmm. and, and that I needed to share that gift. And, and, and what the gift was, wasn't what I thought it would be like my art, yes. any of my arts, right? Yes. You're singing, you're but dancing, your fashion, all of it. Yes. But it was the using of the arts to bring forth this level of, um, of understanding that allows us to see ourselves as one human family. I always tell people, you know, um, segregation works in the way that it needs to work because what it does is it keeps people separate from one another, but also separate from themselves. Interesting. It also keeps them, um, it, it gives them forms of thinking and processing, right? So we we have what I call segregation thinking and segregation mm -hmm. processing, where when you start to look at things holistically, like I we are one word. human family yes. and, and we live in one global village yes. on one planet and we have one history, mm -hmm. that when you look at it from that perspective, it changes everything. While we are, you know, oh, this is the history of my country and this is it and that's it. And, you right. know, and oh, and I have my family and that's it. And I can't love anybody outside of my, you know what I mean? Like yeah. all of that kind of segregation, all those various forms of segregations that we use to separate and that have been used to separate us from one another. That's not why we're here. And it's not right. why we came. Right. Human right. beings are wired for connection. Yes, and, and so, so, you know, having that awareness and bringing that forth to that understanding that racism is a condition that was created over hundreds of years of conditioning. Yep. Prior to that, we still segregated as human beings, but it was religion and it was wealth and, you know, all these kinds of things. Yes. But race as a, as a construct started to be used after the 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 middle of the 1400s ah. you know, when when um Henry the navigator was was given the right to colonize 
by the the Vatican and the and the um, the Spanish crown. The I'm sorry, the uh, Portuguese crown. The the uh, actually the the papacy gave the Portuguese crown the right to colonize the entire west coast of Africa. Oh, those popes. Yeah. And so <laughs> from the 1400s, um, the people of Africa had been colonized. So by the time we are talking about the 1500s and the 1600s, when people were being uh, trafficked mm -hmm. to the so-called new world and yeah. the lands were being taken from, from, from the natives in this part of the world, but the natives in Africa's land were taken first. Mm -hmm. And we don't ever talk about that from that perspective. No, we do and, not. You know, and helping people to understand um, that we've had a lot of misinformation when it comes to this issue of race and when it comes to our history even. Very you know, true. Because yeah. it, the, I mean, we have such a rich history as a human, um, you know, as a human family. And so understanding that, history helps us to begin that healing process that is so needed, um, which I always tell people the reason the doctors ask you for your history when you go to visit because something is wrong. Yeah. They ask for that history because that history helps them to really understand what's come before. That's right. Be able to understand what is happening now to give you something that will help you create a healthier future. 100% agreed. One as an as a physician, I agree with that assessment. <laughs> but re thank you, doctor. <laughs> You're welcome, ma'am. But regarding history, I I do have to say that some aspects, some very intentional aspects of our collective history has, I think, intentionally been um, suppressed. But let's go back to sort of thought and process again. What there's so much talk about, you know, critical race theory. I mean, from your perspective. What is it exactly, and why has it become so politicized? So, if you say the words critical race theory several times, you know, critical race theory, critical yeah. race theory, after a while is a little ditty that stays with you, okay? So, um, easy words for people to remember. Yes, true. And so, so it only took one politician reciting it several times in a speech, yep. and everybody else parroted it. Mm -hmm. And when you ask them, what is critical race theory? They can't explain it to you. Right. It's so the here's thing. The thing about, yeah, it's just, it's, it's another thing that people parrot, right? Yeah. And um, the critical race theory was something that was created by Dr. Crenshaw, an African-American professor. And she, she created that as a way of looking at the impact of race on law. Mm. Critical race theory is something that is taught not in elementary school, nope. not in high school, not even in college. It nope. is taught specifically in law schools. And not all the law schools have critical race theory as a subject. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, and, and, but it is something that is, it's like, you know, the, the McDonald's jingle of, of the, the 70s and 80s. Everybody could remember it. So you hear it and you go, oh, that's, some, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's the right thing to talk about. Exactly. It's insane. And it's like critical race theory and they're teaching our children that. And it's like, yeah. no, they're not. Because yeah. your children couldn't understand it because you probably couldn't even understand it because right. you don't even know what it is. You know right. what I mean? And so, so having the aware, like we don't research, right? Like people just parrot stuff because they heard it somewhere on social yeah. media or on uh, blah, blah, blah. Right. Right. And, um, and without an understanding of what it is, you can't have a decent conversation about it. You're going to end up in a who's right, who's wrong kind of argument. Right. That doesn't serve us. It doesn't move the needle forward. And it doesn't allow us to do the transformation work that we truly need to do if we're going to change this stuff. Right. And so, um, you know, so it, yeah, they, I mean, there are a lot of different things that are being used for, um, that are being politicized. Yeah. And what that does is it takes us out of it. It, it knocks us out of the, um, of racial sobriety. Yeah. And it keeps us from being aware and yes. being conscious yeah. and making choices that, um, that can change the way we do things and allows us to leave less of this stuff to the next generation. Right. It's almost as if you start talking about the critical race 
theory thing without mm -hmm. actually talking about the causes, the sources, the resolutions. Exactly. Right? So, I always tell people that racism is, is institutional, systemic, internalized, personal, and exactly. interpersonal. Exactly. And I wrote a lot about that in my book because there are so many ways in which people, um, they sort of um, hijack the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And very often the people who hijack the conversation are people who have no clue what they're talking about, unfortunately. And you get not their fault. It's just that, you know, we haven't exactly gotten a really good education around this, this topic because we all know what education does. It changes yes. things. It changes things. And that is scary for some people. Yeah. Very true. You've been listening to part one of the Forever Fab podcast with my guest, Milagros Phillips. Stay tuned for part two. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Forever Fab, the podcast on fashion, the art of living, and all things beauty, curated by Dr. Shirley Madir, MD. Live beautifully and help make the world a more beautiful place. Thank you.